my name is Hisham Abdullah, Senior Vice President, Global Head of Oncology um, within R&D at, uh, at GSK. So I oversee um, what is the um, end to end strategic research and development activities for oncology at GSK. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, we have uh, a few key prioritized um, disease areas of interest for us in oncology. Um, those include hematological malignancies. And within hematological malignancies, myelofibrosis is certainly a key area of interest for us as an organization. Myelofibrosis is um, a, really an, an incurable cancer, um, you know, that is kind of grouped, um, you know, within this uh, or within this set of uh, disorders that um, that affect the bone marrow. Um, it's basically a, a progressive disease that is caused by chronic inflammation impacting um, the marrow, um, which ultimately results in, you know, fibrosis, um, you know, of, uh, of the bone marrow over, over time. Um, this results in decreased bone marrow function and ultimately a decrease in uh, what is uh, the production of red blood cells, but also uh, platelets as well too. So decreased erythropoiesis, um, oftentimes requiring you know, blood transfusions and also decreased thrombopoiesis or decreased platelet production as well too by the bone marrow. Um, there is a few different, I would probably say, elements to the disease. There is what is you know, the cytopenias that it causes, um, which I've just described. Um, there are the, um, uh, the organomegalies or increases in the size of certain organs, specifically those that help um, produce or compensate for the decrease in uh, uh, red blood cell or platelet production. So what we call extramedullary hematopoiesis, um, and that includes um, enlargement of the spleen and other organs. Um, and, um, and, and that kind of in some ways results in this uh, red blood cell sequestration that takes place in these organs and specifically the spleen. Um, and, and then finally, there is a third element, which is the constitutional symptoms that patients experience as a result of the cytopenia, the splenomegaly. Um, and these include fatigue, uh, bone pain, um, uh, uh, night sweats, pruritus, cachexia, um, and fever um, as well too. The disease, um, at, at least certainly in the US, impacts around uh, 20,000 patients. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the disease, the disease, like I said, um, you know, has a median survival of about maybe four to six years. Um, and in some ways, you know, certainly, of course, has this, uh, you know, fatal, you know, long term, you know, long term outcome. So in turn, um, it continues to have uh, uh, areas of key unmet need, especially, um, you know, for agents that could help address all three elements, the cytopenia the splenomegaly, but also the symptoms or constitutional symptoms of the disease as well, too. I think I'd probably say in terms of diagnosis, um, it is one of these areas where, you know, it's important for, you know, for patients to have the appropriate workup um, to be able to make the appropriate diagnosis. Um, there is also an element of how each patient is managed and when intervention, you know, takes place, therapeutic intervention takes place as well, too. Uh, but yes, um, you're absolutely correct. It's one of these areas where, you know, there, you know, appropriate diagnosis is, is important um, and, uh, and screening as well, you know, in terms of identifying some of these early, you know, symptoms, uh, but also signs through, you know, laboratory assessments um, and evaluation of, of the bone marrow as well, too. So these patients are, you know, uh, probably say as of now, typically managed through treatment with um, JAK-1-2 um, inhibitors. Um, the, the JAK-STAT pathway, if I may call it that, is um, a key pathway um, in uh, a large portion of patients um, with myelofibrosis. There's typically aberrant or abnormal signaling that takes place through this pathway, which results um, in more downstream activation of key um, mediators of inflammation in the body. Um, this inflammation or these inflammatory factors then continue in um, certainly causing, um, you know, some of this progressive uh, uh, bone marrow fibrosis over time. Um, and so uh, what we've seen over the past several years is 
um, the development of agents that selectively target Jack One Two um, in order to help address that. But uh, but part of the challenge is uh, that um, some of these agents um, uh, also are associated with you know certain cytopenias um, as well too. So there is the anemia that's caused by the disease itself, but then could also be exacerbated by some of the existing agents as well too, if that makes sense. So um, while these agents address the splenomegaly, um, can address the constitutional symptoms, they don't necessarily address the anemia and at times could potentially exacerbate it as well too. Um, and this is where, of course, being able to um, you know, have an agent um, that helps address all three elements, the anemia, the splenomegaly, and the symptoms becomes important. And that's where actually the mechanism of action of mamelotinib um, comes into play. So not only does it address, um, you know, JAK1-2, uh, you know, signaling and help address the chronic inflammation um, that is caused uh, by, uh, you know, by the um, inflammatory signals um, that are activated um, and factors as well too, but it also addresses um, through its mechanism um, what is ACVR1 ALK2 um, you know, uh, uh, signaling, and it inhibits that. What does that do? Well, um, it helps um, certainly in terms of uh, managing, better regulating what is iron uh, homeostasis, um, and in turn, um, you know, helps address the anemia um, that is caused by the disease as well, too. And based on the data that we've seen across the development program um, and the studies um, that, uh, that have been conducted, uh, this is something that, you know, we've seen manifest itself in terms of its impact on, uh, on anemia um, and transfusion independence um, in these patients. So, um, so interestingly enough, uh, there was actually data that was uh, presented on um, uh, from a few key studies from across the development, you know, program as well too, and these are basically um, subgroup analyses of patients um, that were enrolled in uh, three different studies, um, specifically um, two second line studies, um, Momentum and Simplify Two. And then a first line study, which was called Simplify One. I'll start off first with the data that was presented um, recently at ASH from Simplify Two. And it was specifically looking at um, a subgroup of patients um, who required um, uh, red blood cell transfusion uh, on the control arm uh, of that trial. And uh, the control arm of the study was uh, actually patients could have. Uh, continued on uh, 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 on an existing uh, JAK1-2 inhibitor that they were receiving, um, or best supportive care as well, too. Um, and, and then uh, those patients could have been switched over to mamelotinib uh, later on. And specifically, uh, in, those, uh, in those patients that uh, actually switched over to mamelotinib on the control arm, uh, what we saw was uh, the ability of mamelotinib to deliver higher splenic volume reductions, transfusion independence, um, and certainly total symptom score response rates as well too. Um, so so um, this is certainly important um, in terms of being able to, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the, uh, the impact that mamelotinib has on uh, the anemia um, and certainly on maintaining transfusion um, independence um, and uh, and also uh, and also helping you know certainly improve um, you know outcomes for those you know for those uh, subgroup of patients as well. Um, why is this important? Well, um, it's important because 40% of myelofibrosis patients uh, actually at the time of diagnosis um, have moderate to severe anemia. And uh, over the course of the disease, the majority of patients develop anemia as well, as well too. Um, and uh, we also know that um, the anemia um, is actually, at least based on published data, uh, linked to prognosis and long-term outcomes, um, including survival as well too. And so the ability to be able to address that um, is, is important. Um, and like I said, this is where you know, certainly some of this data that's being generated with mamelotinib is, um, 
um, is is important as well as well too. The second data set that was presented uh, was actually from uh, the Simplify One study, which was a first line frontline study. Um, and then also a second line study, um, uh, Momentum. Again, all three studies, Simplify One, Simplify Two, and Momentum were phase three studies. And uh, what I would say uh, for Simplify One and Momentum, um, this analysis actually looked at um, transfusion burden in those patients across these two studies, Simplify One and Momentum, um, and specifically, uh, looking at uh, uh, ways that um, you know patients um, on the uh, on the mamalotinib arm um, either one uh, began um, requiring um, zero units of transfusion at baseline um, and and maintain that uh, um, uh, or a higher proportion of them maintain that over time relative to those that were on the control arm. Um, and then, and then the second really uh, was more around uh, looking at, um, uh, at the the proportion of patients um, uh, that had some level of transfusion requirement at baseline, um, but um, over time, you know, required zero units of red blood red blood cell transfusion as well too. Um, and we saw that there was a higher proportion of patients on the mamalotinib arm. Um, that had zero red blood trials transfusions requirements um, at baseline and maintained it relative to, of course, the um, the control arm as well as well too. So these data, of course, you know, certainly demonstrate that mamblotinib was associated with um, uh, uh, um, with better maintenance of red blood cell transfusion intensity um, and uh, zero red blood cell transfusion status relative to uh, the control arm um, in uh, in these trials. So again, um, why is this important? Um, I think it certainly another um, you know piece of data, uh, you know evidence that helps um, give us better insight into further characterizing the effect that mamalotinib has uh, on anemia uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, transfusion burden um, in patients uh, with myelofibrosis. Um, and uh, ways that it could potentially help address some of this key unmet need in uh, in uh, anemic uh, myelofibrosis patients. The only thing that I would just add is, um, you know, we're continuing to, of course, at this time, um, await um, certainly, uh, you know, additional uh, regulatory outcomes. Um, as you may be aware, of course, in the U.S., um, mamalotinib has gained approval uh, for a uh, um, a line agnostic indication in myelofibrosis in anemic patients. Um, and uh, and then also uh, in Europe, we're awaiting the uh, uh, commission decision on its authorization. Um, and, uh, you know, we look forward to hopefully additional regulatory outcomes in 2024 across different countries and regions um, across the globe. Uh, we're continuing to look at and evaluate, uh, you know, additional um, opportunities for combinations, um, exploring mamalotinib, um, and uh, combination partners, um, again, to help address, you know, continued areas of unmet need and patient segments. Um, and uh, that is an area that, uh, that we're going to continue to evaluate and assess moving forward as well, too.